All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Chem 170 with your host, me, Dr. White. Now, the actual lecture and day we had last Wednesday, somehow the recording got messed up, so I'm redoing it for you. So I'll be going maybe a little quicker, but just take time and look at the video. All right. First of all, remember, coming up Wednesday will be test number three. And on Monday, today, because it's a redo one, I will be going through test number three information, which has already been set out to you. So let's get started. And I'd like to first go through the problem set on carbo, uh, carboxylic acids and their derivatives. All right, let's take a look at this. Now, first question one, give the IUPAC name for the following. Remember, look for what's different, what's not car uh, ox carbon or hydrogen or carbon carbon single bond should get your attention. Oxygen, hydroxyl group, carboxylic acid, name the longest chain with the carbonyl carbon as an alkane, Drop the E, butane, add OIC in the word acid. Remember, the carbonyl carbon is number one. Now, exception to that, when R is a benzene ring, diupac, and the uh, common name is benzoic acid. And if we look at this one right here, what do we have? Carboxylic acid, how many carbons in the longest chain? Nine no name, drop the E, add OIC in the word acid, and now you have no noic acid. And notice the carbonyl carbon is one, on four there's isopropyl, on seven there's ethyl. Remember, I'm not holding you to the uh, alphabet rule for IUPAC, so if you put down four isopropyl, seven ethyl, I would count that correct. Next, we have carboxylate anions. How do we do that? Well, name the element that the cation here came from in front. Then <clears throat> for most of them, you can use like my student did, came up with, name the longest chain, propane, drop the E at O-A-T-E. Now, if R is a benzene ring, you can't use that. You have to use the IUPAC method. And how do we do that? Still name the element of the cation. It comes from potassium. Now look at the carboxylic acid. This would be benzoic acid. Drop the IC in the word acid and add ATE. And that's how you do it. Or is it OATE? I always forget. All right, for esters, one R is not a benzene ring, similar, but now add R prime in front as the alkyl group it came from, ethyl, and then the longest chain, propane, drop the E at OATE. And here are more examples. Now, here's number two, draw the condensed structure from the following organic molecule names. And you need to know both common and also, let me check something real quick. We're recording. You need to know both common and IUPAC names. Cetic acid, the simplest carboxylic acid where R is not an H. Here, how do we do this? Butanoic acid, drop the IC, or look at the IC and there were an acid. If that were an E, butane, it's a carboxylic acid. And here we have a really good one, E, 
four tert butyl two methyl decanoic acid, OIC acid, carboxylic acid. If this were E, decane 10 carbons, carbon two methyl, and carbon four T butyl. And ethyl propanoid, OAT ending, ester or carboxylate anion. If it has an alkyl group in front, it's an ester that's here. Now, I made a mistake, omit G, I won't ask that on a test. Here's a common name you should know, ethyl acetate, comes from acetic acid and the R prime group is ethyl and that's nail polish remover. Now, if we look at I, OAT ending tells you ester or carboxylate anion, you have an element name in the front that's a carboxylate anion, here's sodium benzoate. Now, J, just omit, I didn't do magnesium, same thing, and let's go on. Now, number three, draw the structures for the following organic molecules. Look for what's different. Ooh, carbonyl, hydrogen, carbons, aldehyde, you oxidize it, you'll get a carboxylic acid. Same thing here and here. I just made R more tricky. Next one, one of my favorite, a Grignard reagent. Look for what's different. Magnesium bromide on a carbon, Grignard, carbon dioxide, second step acid and water, and you get a carboxylic acid that's one carbon longer than the carboxylic acid, than the R group in the Grignard that you started with. So here I have two, I end up with a carboxylic acid with three carbons. And if I make it real fancy, like here, here's my R group, and I have one more carbon, and I have my carboxylic acid. Now, reactions of carboxylic acids, carboxylic acids are bases, our acids reacted with the base, you get the carboxylate anion. Here's the general reaction. Same thing here, the only difference Instead of sodium, I have potassium hydroxide. Therefore, I get the potassium carboxylate anion. Now, here's an important one. Remember, draw or give all the products for the following reaction. What's this? Carboxylic acid, acid. Sodium bicarbonate, baking powder. That increases the pH by neutralizing or reacting with the acid to form the carboxylate anion. CO2 is given off as a gas, you see bubbles, and water. And remember the little rocket ship I talked about that my father taught me how to take vinegar, which is acetic acid and water, and baking powder, mix them together, builds up the CO2, and poof, the top of the rocket shoots off. And boy, was that cool when you were five or six years old. Uh, 6A, omit, I didn't ask you to learn calcium. Same thing for 6B. All right, let's move on. If we look at this one, C, what do I have here? Carboxylic acid. What do I have here? Alcohol, acid catalyst. What do you get? An ester. Remember the carbon with the hydroxyl group will be the carbon bond to the oxygen, the ester. And also always remember, do you break carbon-carbon single bonds? No, you never break carbon-carbon single bonds. And notice I've done the chemistry instructor's favorite trick on a test right here. Let me move this out of the way. Hold on one sec. There we go. Right here, I have a carboxylic acid, carbon, carbon, hydroxyl, alcohol. You make an ester. 
what carbon is the hydrox group on, the end one of four. This comes along for a ride, your R group, and that's how you make an ester. Now, for GNH, I forgot to put the water down there, but let's look at this reaction. What do we have here? Carbonyl, oxygen, carbons here, carbons here, because sodium hydroxide or any base won't react with a benzene ring. So this is an R group. You take an ester, base and water, you get the, not the carboxylic acid, but the carboxylate anion of the carboxylic acid you would have used to make that ester plus the alcohol. In this case, R is benzene, so I get sodium benzoate. R prime is methyl, I get methanol. Now, the carbon bond to oxygen and R prime will be the carbon that has the hydroxyl group here. Next, what do we have? We have an ester. Look for what's different. But it's not a carbon-carbon single bond or carbon or hydrogen should get your attention. And here we have an ester, acid and water. Remember, we're going to come back to this reaction because this is what's going on in your stomach when you eat anything that has fat or oil in it. And acid and water, where do you get the H plus? Well, that's in your stomach from the hydrochloric acid, but we'll talk more about this. And you get back the carboxylic acid and the alcohol you would have used to make that ester. Remember, the carbon in R prime with the oxygen will be the carbon with the hydroxyl group. And here, R, you don't break carbon, carbon single bond, same thing here in R prime. And you get a carboxylic acid, this one, and this ester. And the next two, I'm doing the same thing, except making more complex R groups. H plus and water will not react with a benzene ring. So this is R prime. We have an ester. Here's R. And you'll get this carboxylic acid and this alcohol, which you know is phenol. Now, a fun reaction for Dr. White. And that's because Dr. White loves Grignard reagents. I forgot to put the two there. Because if I were talking to other organic chemists, we wouldn't put the two there. And I forgot. Well, on test, I won't. And what do we have here? An ester plus two moles of a Grignard, second step acid water. This is one of those special reactions where you can make a carbon-carbon single bond. Not one, but two. And keep your eye on the carbonyl carbon. That becomes this carbon, which is an alcohol, the OR prime from the ester becomes the second alcohol. So you actually get two products. Notice here, I have this ester plus this Grignard. I make these two alcohols. Now, in C or E, I'm sorry, excuse me, I got the hiccups. Well, anyways, we have an ester plus two of this Grignard. Remember, the carbon with the magnesium iodide is the carbon to the hydroxyl group of the first alcohol made from the ester. This is R, and I've made, this is our triple prime, two of them on that same carbon with an alcohol. My R prime from my ester becomes my second alcohol. If you look at this, the one step, I've made a very, very complex alcohol, and that's a good thing. And that's the beauty of Grignard reagents. And that's that. All right, I'd ask any questions, but nobody's here because I'm redoing the video. All right, let's go into a new chapter. And this new chapter deals with synthetic polymers. Now, if I, I could very easily give a two semester, full two semester graduate level course on synthetic polymers. I'm gonna teach you everything you wanna know about synthetic polymers in less than 40 minutes or less. So I'm just gonna do a quick overview, but it will give you some knowledge about synthetic polymers. I already have the annotations on the slide. So I'll go a little quicker. 
but you can always run back the video or stop it and look. All right, like I said, there's already stuff on the slides that I wrote when I did this last Wednesday. So this should speed things up a little. All right, this chapter deals with synthetic polymers. What is a polymer? You should know. See, it says it on the slide. It's a macromolecule. Macromolecule means big molecule built by repetitive linking of smaller units called monomers. Now, the word polymer, poly means many, mer means unit, and in monomer, mono means one unit. Think of a long, long, very long freight train where all the boxcars are the same or very similar. That's really what a polymer is. But well, we don't use boxcars from a train. We use segments of molecules or fragments looked together. And you should know a polymer is a macromolecule built by repetitive linking of smaller units called monomers. Now, when we talk about polymers, there's two main ways of classifying polymers. One is by its physical property. The other is by a chemical property. And if we look at the chemical property, the two main types of polymers are addition polymers and condensation polymers. You should know a condensation polymer right here is a polymer that has all the same type of monomer. Think of a freight train which every box car is identical. That's what an addition polymer is. It has the same type of monomer. Now, you should know some examples along with the definition. An example of this is the saran wrap, plastic wrap in your kitchen that's made up of a single monomer repeated over and over again, like a million times. Now, another example of an addition polymer are rubber car tires. Rubber car tires are made of, of this monomer, which you don't have to know. It's called butadiene. And this is what Mother Nature and also man we make synthetic rubber use. So the first type of chemical designation type monomer is addition polymer. They have all the same type of monomer. You should know this. See, it even says it on red. The second type of polymer is called the condensation polymer. You should also know this. And a condensation polymer is made from two or more different types of monomers. Again, a condensation polymer is made from two or more different types of monomers. And think of a long freight train made up of, say, white and black or white and blue, whatever colors you want to use, white and brown railroad cars, freight trains, or cars, box cars. And it's white, blue, white, blue, white, blue, white, blue. And that's really an example of a condensation polymer, except we don't use box cars. We use segments of molecules. Now, what's an example of this? Well, a nylon jacket. Another one would be a urethane foam, like in your seat cushions of your car. And a third one, which I don't have here, but I'll write down, and that would be a plastic bottle, such as my water bottle. If you look at this, this is made from a condensation polymer. I'm going to use it. So next time you see one of these, this is a condensation polymer.
and you should know that a condensation polymer is made from two or more different types of monomers. And you should know an example of one, like my water bottle. Now, the other type of way of designated polymers is based on a key physical property of the polymer. Now, if you notice on the slide, it says, know this, you should. Again, this is not going to be on test three. This will be on test number four. Now, the first type of designation for a polymer by a key physical is thermoplastic. And you should know that a thermoplastic polymer, once formed, can be reheated to form a new shape. I'll say it again. Once you make the polymer, you can reheat it. The uh, for, once formed can be reheated to form a new shape. In other words, you can recycle it. An example, this is polyester, such as my water bottle, uh, polyethylene, saran wrap, and the one thing you should know, there's no correlation between the chemical designation, addition polymer or condensation polymer, and the physical property. They're the system. So a thermoplastic, once formed, can be reheated to form a new shape. An example, that would be your nylon jacket, uh, plastic pop bottle, saran wrap. Now, the other type is called the thermoset. And thermoset, you should know, is once formed, it cannot be reheated to form a new shape. Again, once formed, it cannot be reheated to form a new shape. Example of this, the best one is rubber, your car tires. And if you've ever seen from parts of the world where there's a lot of uh, problems going on and people block the roads with car tires and they set them on fire, they don't melt. Why? Because they are thermoset polymers. And that's one of the problems with rubber tires. How do you recycle them? Well, you can retread them, but you really can't recycle them like you can with plastic say pop bottles. Now, another example is phenolic resins. Where do you find that? Well, if you look at the buttons on your shirt or blouse, and if they're not metal, that's usually phenolic resins. Same thing with the knobs on your oven. And there are other examples like urethane foam can't be recycled. Now, turning the switch off on this slide, Real quick thing, and I could do a whole semester on free radical polymerization. There's something called a radical. That's where carbon has a single electron and it's very reactive. It will react with a carbon carbon double bond and it does what's called an addition reaction. And it forms a new radical which reacts more and more and it builds up a polymer like this. And if there's something I wanted to carbons for some reason, polymer chemists call that L for addition, you can have it. An example and here it shows it where N can be on the order of a million or 500,000. That's a big macromolecule. Now, turn your switch off when L is hydrogen, we call that polyethylene, which is really the saran wrap or other plastic wrap. When L is a methyl, it's called polypropylene, poly meaning many. And if you've ever bought electronics in a bubble package and you can't open it up and you fight and fight and you want to get a, the heaviest saw you can find to cut into that, that's polypropylene. Now, when L is a benzene ring, we call that polystyrene, and that's the white, and you can make a foam out of that, and that's the insulated white cups. You can put hot coffee in or cold stuff, and also those real inexpensive white, lightweight coolers you can buy. 
when L is a halogen chlorine, we call that polyvinyl chloride, otherwise known as PVC, and that's the white plastic pipes in your bathroom. Now, when you take a monomer and all the hydrogens on ethylene, that's what this is called, are fluorines, that makes a molecule we call Teflon, which is one of the things, your nonstick pots and pans. Now, it turns out there's an important thing you should know about, switches back on, and that's called cross-linking. If you look over here, think of each one of these lines as a long polymer, macromolecule. And think of strings. If I had a bunch of strings like this, and I pulled it, I'd be pretty strong. If I pulled it this way, they'd fall right apart. Well, that was a problem with polymers. And the way that was solved by forming chemical bonds right here between this different macromolecules or strings. And now if you pull this way, it's a lot harder to pull it apart. And that makes it more rigid and gives special physical properties. And this is called cross-linking. Now I have a sad story to tell you. How many of you have heard of Goodyear tires? You probably all have. Guess what? There's never been a Goodyear part of Goodyear tires. How did that happen? Well, back in the early 1800s, a lot of people were trying to get cross-linking to work to make polymers, mainly rubber at that time, much more useful. Because the rubber, before they cross-link, was sort of this gummy mess. That's sort of not too useful. Sort of not too useful, that's not good English. But anyways, you got the idea. Well, there was this one inventive person, Goodyear, I can't remember his first name, who came up with the first patent, commercialized the way of cross-linking. It's called vulcanization. They use sulfur. That's why rubber, especially rubber tires, smell bad when you burn them because it's really the sulfur in there. If you didn't have cross-linking, it wouldn't smell bad, but you couldn't use it. Well, it turns out the sad story is Goodyear was an alcoholic. And two very astute businessmen saw what he had done and came to him and said, we'll give you a lot of money if you sell us the patent rights and also give us the uh, right to use your name because a lot of people know you on our company. And he did, made a nice amount of money. Unfortunately, he drank it all away. Sad story. And that's cross-linking. And cross-linking, again, is when you take the polymer molecules and you link them together molecularly. And it's very important. I've already talked about condensation polymers made with two different types of monomers. Each monomer usually has a, a, at least two different, two functional groups, such as I've already talked, a diol or dicarboxylic acid to make a diester. The main functional groups, not the only ones, but the main in condensation are polyester, ester functional group, polyamic. And you can also have urethane and formaldehyde and epoxy uh, polymers. And polyester, you have a diacid, switches off on this slide, a diol, you make this. And notice at this end, I can react that further with the diol, make ester, this with the diacid. And as I mentioned when we did at the end of uh, carboxylic acids, this is going to repeat over and over again. And that's what my water bottle is made of. Now, if you do an amide, now here we have a diamide or diamine, I'm sorry. Now this is an acid chloride, diacetyl chloride. They react just like carboxylic acids, but more reactive. 
And therefore, you have a base to neutralize the HCL that's formed there. And this forms an amide right here. And for this specific diamine and diacid chloride, you make this molecule, you weave it together in layers. We call that Kevlar, and that's used to make the bulletproof vest to protect our police. Polyurethanes are made from this isocyanate, and I'm not going to go into chemistry other than here's the molecule we call a urethane, and it's very strong and uh, inert to other reactions, and you can make foams about it. I taught you earlier about the tertiary amine catalyst. That's about it. I'm going to skip phenolic resins for now. I'll talk about it if I have time. And that's everything you wanted to know about synthetic polymers in a very quick time. Remember, there's a lot more. I can easily do a whole two semester, yes, not one, but two semester graduate level course on synthetic polymers. But now you have a good feel for it. All right, let's talk about the lab that you should be finishing up and handing in on Wednesday. And that lab deals with esters and carboxylate anions. Now, you know what's an ester. And this is an ester. Now, how do you make esters? Carboxylic acid plus an alcohol in the presence of an acid, you make an ester. Now, for this lab, H plus equals or is sulfuric acid, H2SO4. And what you'll be doing in these various parts is mixing together different carboxylic acids and different alcohols. And the nice thing about esters is they're responsible for the taste and smell of many fruits and vegetables. And you're not gonna be able to taste it because there's gonna be sulfuric acid in there, but you can smell it. And here I have the examples here, the different alcohols, acetic acid, you should know the structure of. For table one, make sure you put in the draw the esters here, because we're not in the lab. I'm giving you what it smells like. This one, oh, I wish we were doing it. I hate bananas, but doing this lab, I like it. When you make it, you'll make the ester. When you smell this one using acetic acid, an isomeal alcohol, which is a common name for this IUPAC name, you'll smell something that, wow, that smells almost like a banana, but something different. And most of you will say, oh, it smells like banana taffy, laffy, or whatever it's called. Uh, I don't buy it. I don't like taffy, and I don't like bananas. But I love this lab because students smell, how come it doesn't smell like a real banana? And I would tell you, the ester coming out of your beaker when you smell it is a much higher concentration than the ester that you have in a banana. And because it's much stronger, your brain interprets it sort of as banana, but not real. Now, the one nice thing about this lab is, guess what? When you buy products like that with banana flavor and says artificial flavor, what do you think they mean? And time's up. They make the ester for banana in a chemical plant like this and this. They purify it. And the many artificial flavors are just different esters made in chemical plants. And if you do 1B, you'll be doing cell silk acid with methanol. And the ester, you have to draw it smells like mint. 
And if you ever smell the white life savers, which I'd be going around if we were in lab, students say, what does it smell like? And I go like this, remember something that's round and white with a hole in it? And you say, well, oh, life, and you go, mint life savers. How do you think they get the flavor for that? It's artificial flavor. And one seed will take acetic acid and one octanol. And this is one of the main esters in an orange that makes an orange smell and taste like an orange. And don't forget to draw the structure. Now, the next thing I like to talk about is something you never thought Dr. White would get into, and that's diapers. I don't mean get into talk about diapers and personal hygiene for women products. And they all contain nowadays what's called a super absorbent uh, polymer, and that's polysodium acrylate. And the structure for polysodium acrylate Hold on. Let me do it. I was writing the monomer and I should have written the polymer. Let's do this again. And this is polysodium acrylate, and it's a car polycarboxylate anion. And this can, <clears throat> excuse me, bond nicely to hydrogen bonding. And what you're going to do in this lab is find out if Dr. White's lying to you. How are you going to do that? Well, you're going to take in one beaker the polymer and add some water and mix it and see what you get. You'll get a gel, it's in the data. And then what you'll do is make another beaker with it, add water, get a gel. And what you're gonna do is then add some acid HCl, and what that does is, this is a conjugate base, the carboxylate anion is a conjugate base of an acid. You add acid, and you'll get this carboxylic acid. In this case, what you'll get And you'll see, does the water still hydrogen bond to this carboxylic acid? And then you'll take this molecule, or in the beaker, you'll add sodium hydroxide. And what happens is sodium hydroxide is a base. You'll remove this and go back to the carboxylate anion. And you'll see, does this hydrogen bond better to water than this? Which one hydrogen bonds better? And luckily, Dr. White gave you the data. When you see it becomes a gel, that means it's hydrogen bonding real good. When it's a liquid, not so good. And by the way, this is a multi-billion dollar industry. Years ago, I consulted for the main company that made this molecule. They had the patent rights. And because of that, I got to learn about this. And about a year or two later, their patent rights expired. So they decided, well, this is going to become a commodity chemical. We'll sell it. And they sold their 
rights to that business for multi-billion dollar. Now, where do you see those type of products? If we're in a class in a lab at ECC, I have some diapers to rip apart and show you. You'll see some fiber. And if you go like this or shake it, you'll see all these little particles come out. And that's that polymer. The other one is feminine hygiene products that are very thin now for that time of the month uses the same thing to absorb moisture, which blood, and not to get you too uh, grossed out, is mainly water. So same thing with urine from a baby, what's it? mainly water. And that's how these do. So next time you see a diaper, think about that serious organic chemistry. And with that, I think I'm done. I'm gonna say goodbye, goodbye, gang is on. And I'll see you next lecture.